Okay, I will go to the uh, next talk. So the next speaker is uh, Gretchen Campbell. Uh, so I introduce uh, uh, Gretchen Campbell. So uh, Gretchen uh, is director, is one director of a joint quantum institute. So it's an institute uh, joining National Institute of Standards and Technology with the University of Maryland in US. So uh, Gretchen is an experimental physicist especially leading expert in the atom superfluidity. Her work on toroidal shaped uh, superfluid has been really instrumental for the entire atomtronics field. So uh, today, uh, Gretchen will talk about ring uh, condensate how they can teach us uh, uh, anything on co in cosmology. Please. Great. Um, thanks so much. Um, so yeah, so it's a, a pleasure to be able to, to talk today at this conference. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about some recent experiments um, that we have been doing with our toroidal ring BC. Now, since this is an atom tronics conference, I think we're going to see many uh, talks where people take advantage of ring shaped BCs. But luckily, since I'm early on in the conference, let me remind you about why it's so sort of interesting to take a BC or say, you know, a, a, any kind of sort of superfluid gas and trap it in a ring geometry. Now we've been studying this system for a number of years now. Um, and in part it's because, you know, it's a nice system to just study some fundamental physics, for example, looking at questions of superfluidity and superflow. In our system, we use an atomic BC. Later on in the conference, we'll hear about some nice results with, with fermions loaded into ring shaped traps. And of course, you know, atomtronic circuits. We've been looking to see, can we take advantage of the superfluid properties of our BEC to make interesting and useful atomtronic circuits? Circuits. Something my group has worked on in the past is can we create something that works in a way analogous to a, a superconducting squid, an RF squid, where instead of a magnetic field sensor, could we make a rotation sensor? I'll come back to this briefly at the end of the talk in case we have time. And of course, you know, I'm a NIST person, so our hope is, you know, maybe this could be used for better interferometry or sensors. Um, but today I want to talk about sort of a, a side path we have taken, and that is the question of can we also take these ring shaped boson sign condensates and use them as a system to say, study cosmological physics or look at models of analog gravity. So, you know, what astrophysical phenomena can we f simulate? So probably, you know, many people now are familiar with some beautiful experiments that have been, have been going on in recent years with event horizons, sonic event horizons with moving potentials. And, you know, this field was very much created by this very nice paper by Unruh back in 1980, where he proposed perhaps one could simulate black hole physics by taking advantage of sound waves. Now in a BC system, that means we can say use phonons. And there have been some beautiful experiments in the last five years by Jeff Steinhauer's group where they've indeed sort of created these these event horizons using uh, bare, moving potentials in condensates. Now uh, another class of experiments are you know looking at say the formation of structure in a universe. Now this is sort of kibble zurich type experiments which again this was created uh, originally proposed in a paper by Zurich. And you know the idea is by quenching through a phase transition either a quantum or a thermal phase transition you know and you can look and see what kinds of defects form stochastically in these systems. Um, now this is just a, a sample of some of the experiments that have been done in cold atom um, you know, there's been many kibble zurich type experiments that have been done over the year to sort of look at that type of, of phenomena. Now, what I wanted to talk about today was something a little bit different. And this is the question of, you know, here I have sort of a cartoon picture of sort of um, inflation in the early universe. And the question is, can we actually learn something about this by now using our ring shape condensate, where now we're going to take our ring shape condensate and expand it. We're going to inflate it over some period of time. Um, now, these experiments were very much motivated by some conversations with some of my colleagues at Maryland. And in particular, um, Ian Spielman came back from a conference a few years ago where he'd had some discussions with Jason Ho about, you know, taking, say, arbitrarily shaped 1D, you know, condensates and dilated them and looking at how quantum fields behave after undergoing inflation. 
Now, at the time, Ian realized that his experiment wasn't well set up to do that, but perhaps our rings would be a nice system to demonstrate these types of things. Coincidentally, I'd already started having some conversations with Ted Jacobson, who's a theorist at Maryland and just up the stairs, and he's sort of an expert on thinking about you know, questions of gravity and, and, and was very interested by the experiments that had been going on with, with cold atom physics and, and black hole physics. So through these conversations, we started to think about you know, what types of things could we look at with our ring-shaped condensates. Now, what is our system? Um, so for our system, we also use a digital micromirror device to create our potentials. So we use a combination of two optical dipole traps. In the horizontal direction, we have a, a blue sheet. So we create this using a pi phase plate. So essentially, this is sort of a repulsive uh, sandwich that we uh, trap our BEC tightly to give us confined against gravity. And then in the vertical direction, we create our ring shakes potential using the, the digital micro digital micromere device, our DMD. Now, we sort of focused down many micromere devices to a given uh, point spread function. So because of this, we're able to use half toning so that we could not only use this to create our ring potential, but also to modulate the ring potential locally on the BEC. Um, now, for everything I talk about today, um, we use a, a rings that range in radii from about 10 microns to 45 microns. I'll talk a little bit at the end of the talk about our new system and how big a ring we can maybe make in the future. Now, there are going to be a number of people who are talking about rings experiment. Here's just a, a small list of other people who have ring-shaped uh, traps using either, say, all optical or a combination of optical and, and magnetic field methods. Now, as I said, we use this half-toning uh, method to sort of locally turn on and off some fraction of the mirrors. If we convolve that with the point spread function of our imaging system, it gives us some sort of smooth potential um, that we are able to vary. <clears throat> now, Today, um, what we mostly do, I'll talk about, is how we can sort of take this DMD and use it to imprint, print, imprint phonon excitations in our condensate. So here's a picture of a, a potential we can make. So here's sort of two rings, and say on the inner ring, we can use half toning so that we create a, a region of, of potential which is deeper or shallower that allows us to imprint a phonon mode in our condensate. Um, here is a, a picture of one such phonon mode where essentially we're creating a, a m equals 2 or q equals 2 mode. So we have two maximum in the standing wave, right? So our phonon mode is essentially just a, a standing density wave, which is going to propagate in our cloud. So we uh, temporarily change our potential. So we imprint this phonon mode. We then allow it to propagate. Let's see here. So here is an actual picture of the BC. We imprint the we modulate the potential to imprint the phonon mode, and then we can allow it to propagate around the ring. Now, I can also make a plot that looks like this, where now we are sort of on the, the y-axis. I've sort of stretched out the BC so that it's now a 1D system, so that's the angle around the ring. On the y-axis is time, and you can see sort of how the, the normalized density changes as a function of time and see the standing wave. Now, I can also plot out the nor normalized phonon amplitude in this way, and from these types of curves, we can, of course, you know, get the frequency, which gives us a measure of the speed of sound. And there's also a decay to these phonon modes, sort of a phenomenological decay, which for our system we assume is primarily sort of Landau damping that occurs. Um, but by plotting this out, we can measure these things. OK, so we can take our ring shape BC. That's going to sort of be our toolbox. And we can imprint standing wave phonon modes. So how can we use the system now to say, perhaps, you know, simulate um, some features associated with inflation in the early universe? OK, so what is the analogy here? So first in cosmology, you know, we're going to see, be looking at sort of a simulating a quasi 1D universe. And in our BEC experiment, that's going to be our ring shape BEC, which we have in our, our trap. Now, in cosmology, you have sort of fluctuating scalar fields, relative to relativistic scalar fields, which are sort of like photons. So how are we going to simulate this? Well, in our BEC system, these are going to be phonons that we can either imprint by perturbing our trap, or perhaps long term, maybe we can see um, you know, spontaneously created particles in the future. And finally, how can we actually drive inflation or expansion of the universe? And well, again, using our DMD, we can actually just uh, drive a change in the radius of our pen potential, which drives expansion of our, our BEC universe. Now, what are the types of things one could see in this system? Well, in you know, inflation in the early universe, you had red shifting of photons. 
we will have phonons, so we'd expect to see redshifting of phonons. Now, another thing we'd hope to see is particle creation. Right after inflation, um, there was a creation of particles. Could we see these types of things? Or perhaps cosmological horizons, where if we say, you know, superluminally expand our BEC, we have disconnected regions, and can we see sort of, you know, uh, defects created when those uh, regions uh, reconnect. So these were the things that we were thinking about originally by looking to see if, if we could see in our, our BEC universe. So what does it look like? So as I said, we're going to take the radius of our potential and we're going to expand it over some short period of time. Here on the top, I show a series of images of what it looks like as we expand our ring condensate. And on the bottom here, I show um, how the radius of our ring changes during that process. So the, the dashed curve is the actual potential that we, we send to the atom. So that's how we're changing our ring. And the solid curve shows the actual measured radius. So what we saw is when we uh, sort of originally took our BEC and we very quickly expanded it, the, the BEC essentially overshot the potential and we saw sort of a ringing in the size of it. Right, we saw sort of a, it overshot and then came back and oscillated back and forth. So sort of a, a center of mass oscillation. Now, one thing we were a little bit surprised about is to see how quickly this oscillation damped out. Now, if this were to be a harmonic trap, we would expect this kind of sort of center of mass sloshing to sort of last forever. But instead, we, this sort of you know resonant oscillation very quickly damped out. So our first question is, what was going on here? You know, where was that energy going? And to take a look at this, we decided to measure the structure factor. So essentially, we looked at, you know, sort of the length scale of density modulations in the BEC as a measure of what types of phonons we were created. Now, when we start out, essentially, our structure factor is flat, which is what we would expect with a BEC that doesn't have phonon excitations in it. We then, at the undergo expansion. And actually, at the height of this first oscillation, you see that our structure factor is still flat. So essentially, we have this sort of resonant excitation, but haven't created other any other types of phonons in our system. Now, as we progress through it, as this resonant excitation sort of starts to die off, we see the we see we start to create phonons as a muth of phonons in our system. Those phonons get larger and larger, and then as time goes on, the system thermalize, thermalizes and, and it died back down. Um, so what's going on here? So, you know, one question is, well, you know, is this actually pair production, right? Are we sort of seeing the spontaneous pair production of phonons in our system? And the answer is no, um, that's not what we're seeing. And instead, what we see is something that looks more like a process where we have some sort of homogeneous radio, radio mode, which is, you know, being transferred into as a muthal modes. Okay, so some resonant effect with this sort of radi radial phonon mode. Now, I know very little bit about cosmology, but luckily, you know, these experiments have all been done in collaboration with Ted Jacobson. So when Ted saw this, he said, well, of course, this looks like something perhaps reminiscent of reheating um, after inflation in the universe. Now, what is reheating? Well, it's postulated that uh, inflation in the early universe was driven by this quantum field, the inflaton, which sort of started at the top of some, say, quartic potential. And as it drove down this potential, it let it drove inflation in the universe. OK, so essentially, you know, during this process, which, you know, presumably would cool sort of the azimuth of the degrees of freedom of the condensate. But when it sort of got to this, the bottom of this potential, there were sort of resonant oscillations that then decayed into other particles. Right. And that sort of, you know, created he uh, reheating after this. Right. So and so what we see here is more reminiscent of this. Right. We have this sort of, you know, coherent radial oscillation that then decayed over time into azimuth of phonons. Now, in the simplest model, this inflaton just directly oscillates around this potential and decays into to, to these lower energy particles. And at first we thought perhaps this is what we were also seeing. <clears throat> Now, to understand this more, uh, Steve Eckel, who was a postdoc on the experiment at the time, did some very nice um, stochastic projected GPE simulations to try to see you know, how are we really creating these phonons and these excitations in our system. Now, on the top here, I show some simulations where on the top you see sort of the phase profile of our BEC and on the bottom the density. And if you sort of zoom in, what you see is at, after undergoing this expansion, what we're really doing is actually, as the, the BEC sort of runs up against the potential, we're imprinting a, a dark soliton on our condensate, right? So this is sort of you know similar to a BEC sort of reflecting off of a tunnel junction or something like that. So essentially, we were imprinting a dark soliton that uh, 
snaked around our BEC. Now, of course, a dark soliton in this geometry is going to have a snake instability. It's going to be unstable. So as a function of time, that dark soliton quickly started to break down into vortex anti-vortex pairs. And this is what led to the decay of this sort of uh, excitation in our BEC. Now these vortex anti-vortex pairs, some of them annihilate, and that of course led to the creation of phonons. Now we can actually calculate the structure factor from our GPE simulations, and if we compare that to the experiment, they match quite well um, within sort of the resolution of our, our detection in the experiment. Now, unfortunately, we can't actually see these uh, these solitons of vortices, but at least from our, our simulations, they seem to to match the results quite well. So, you know, at first we thought perhaps we had seen something that looked like a uh, a particle creation, but instead was maybe something that was reminiscent of reheating in the early universe. So what about this idea of the redshifting of phonons? So now, uh, as opposed to looking at sort of spontaneously created excitations, we're going to imprint a standing wave phonon mode before doing the expansion and look to see how that phonon mode evolves after the expansion. <clears throat> So here I show, again, this sort of normalized phonon amplitude that I showed earlier, except now what I'm doing is looking at um, how the frequency of this phonon mode changes after the expansion. So the gray bar shows sort of the epoch of expansion. And as you can see, um, not so surprisingly, since we're sort of increasing the circumference of our BEC, we do indeed see a red shifting of the phonon frequency. Now, starting from the GPE equation, we can, sort of, we can write down a differential equation for how we expect these phonon modes to evolve. And you know, one thing that we didn't expect, but of course Ted Jacobson expected, was you actually get this uh, additional term here that leads to damping. So this first term here is just a phenom phenomenological term. This is sort of our lambda or blue damping or whatever damping is occurring in our system. But we get the second non-dissipative term, and this is a Hubble friction term. Okay, so sort of an inflation, you know, it's sort of when the universe underwent a, um, uh, inflation, sort of relativistic scalar fields are thought to have sort of been attenuated by this, this Hubble friction, which just comes from, you know, you sort of dilating the, the underlying metric, right? So it turned out that while not, not only could we see sort of this red sh shifting of phonons, but we could also extract this Hubble friction term by seeing how our phonon fields were attenuated by our expanding, uh, condensate. Now, we weren't actually expecting to sort of see this Hubble friction term, so it turns out the way we had took this data, we did not have fantastic signal to noise, and it was somewhat hard for us to extract this, but we did some, you know, simple, you know, again, GPE simulations to see that if this sort of, uh, this this equation, this differential equation that sort of describes the phonon evolution is what we would expect to see. And indeed, here on the left, I show sort of the, the blue dots are our GPE simulation, and then sort of the, the green or red curves show what our sort of wave equation predicts with and without the Hubble friction. So green is without the Hubble friction term, the, uh, the red is with, so you can see that indeed, if we include Hubble friction, um, this does match quite nicely what we would expect from the phonon modes. Now, one thing which initially confused us from our very simple sort of derivation, we actually expected that the sort of coefficient in front of the Hubble friction here should be one, um, but instead we actually measured a half in these early experiments, although with not a great signal to noise, so it had a very large error bar. Um, so it's, at, at first we were somewhat confused by this, but shortly afterwards there was a sort of nice PRA by Laurenti and Plata who explained that essentially we, uh, you know, our differential equation was in terms of just one parameter and you needed to properly separate sort of density and phase modes um, to correctly sort of uh, calculate this, this Hubble friction term. Now, at the time, we thought it would have been great to go back and sort of see if we can sort of do a better job of measuring this. But after finishing these experiments, we actually took apart the experiment and moved it from NIST to the University of Maryland. So Avanash was the senior student on our initial experiments, with, and here he is sort of standing next to our Zeeman slower after we uh, deconstructed the experiment. Um, but luckily, in the, the last couple of years, the experiment has been sort of you know, resurrected. And actually in the fall of 2009, we finished uh, building a new experiment and uh, had ring condensates again for the first time. Now, unfortunately, fall 2019 did not give us many months um, to do experiments before we were all sort of sitting at home for a little bit. But that gave us a lot of time to think about, you know, how would we actually like to go back and maybe explore 
um, measuring this Hubble friction term a little bit better. And in the meantime, uh, Steve Eckel, who had moved on to a permanent position, and Ted Jacobson did a, a more careful um, derivation of how we expect this phonon modes to evolve and what this Hubble friction would turn, where now they've sort of fully taken into account sort of the the changing transverse profile of the con condensate sort of in this hydrodynamic limit and how sort of the trap changes and the potential changes during this expansion. So here again, now I show this, this uh, differential equation for how we expect the phonon mode, right? So what we've now, re we have this sort of velocity dependent Hubble friction term. Now, one thing to point out is so far we had done experiments with expanding condensates. Now for expanding condensates in an inflating universe, you expect this Hubble friction term, which is non dissipative to attenuate the scalar fields. But if you were to say have a contracting universe, you would actually see amplification. So one nice thing about this is of course, this phenomenological damping term is quite large. So in a contracting universe where now these terms have opposite effects would maybe allow you to measure it a little bit better. Now, another thing, is we, thanks to these uh, the, the Plata paper and now the um, Steve's paper, we know that this Hubble friction term depends on the geometry of the trap, right? So essentially, if we have sort of a power law model of our trapping potential, there's going to be sort of this R to the alpha dependence. Now, in our sort of to the zeroth order, since this term here is essentially how the volume changes, we would expect that our Hubble friction parameter would just be equal to the alpha for whatever our trapping parameter was. Now we also did some some simulations to try to figure out, you know, what were the best parameters we could use in order to extract this Hubble friction. And another thing we discovered was that it turns out our ability to measure the Hubble friction parameter very much depends on the phase of the phonon mode when we do the expansion. Now the reason for this is because essentially we're we're doing this expansion in a very non-adiabatic regime, right? So we're essentially doing superluminal expansion. So because of that, um, we're sensitive to the, the phase of the phonon field when we expand it. And you get this sort of oscillatory give it here. Nine minutes. Okay, awesome. So from this, you can see that essentially by varying the phase that when we do this expansion, um, it, it, this affects the Hubble friction. Now it turns out these initial experiments we did were right here with a phase about two pi, where essentially it was incredibly hard to distinguish a, a Hubble friction parameter of say a half versus zero, okay? <clears throat> so luckily, um, we now are back up and running and we're able to actually go back and sort of measure this more carefully with both contracting condensates and expanding condensates. So here I show a, a set of data, both contraction and expansion, where we've actually gone through and changed the temporal phase of when we do this expansion so that we were more sensitive to uh, being able to, to see this. <clears throat> and what did we actually find? Well, um, so from this data, we essentially do a simultaneous fit of all of the data sets to allow us to pull out not only this geometric factor, but also the Hubble friction. Now I said, we would have actually expected that the geometric factor should be the Hubble friction parameter. And we found things that were consistent within two sigma. So from our contraction data, we got an alpha of 0.5 for the expansion 0.47. And then for the, the Hubble friction parameters, we got something a little bit smaller. Now with our power law potential, we would expect this geometric factor to range from about a half for a harmonic potential to one if we had a hard wall potential. So this would indicate that it, we have somewhat of a, a harmonic potential. Now the average value of this is slightly less than a half, which maybe also says that the simple power law model is inadequate. And perhaps this is because our potential actually maybe changes during the expa expansion. Now the Hubble friction we measure now, we have a much better precision than what we had on our initial data. Um, but you know, we sort of see a two sigma difference between these um, quantities and we're still trying to figure out where that comes from. So one possibility is we create a pretty large amplitude phonon mode in order to be able to measure it. And perhaps, you know, nonlinear damping effects are, you know, compromising this measurement of the damping because of this. Or also, you know, we have a sort of simple scaling of the speed of sound um, using this sort of power law model. And that's really in, this is in the thin ring approximation, which is not necessarily um, ap applicable in our sort of very small radiuses. So we're still sort of trying to figure out um, exactly where these differences come in. But, you know, through these experiments, we were able to do a much better measurement. And here I also show, you know, again, I'm showing this plot where we see sort of the amplitude, um, this oscillatory behavior since we do these sort of non-adiabatic expansion and you can see we sort of have this oscillatory behavior if our expansion was adiabatic we would have expected to not have the the final amplitude depend on the phase at all <clears throat> 
Okay, so where are we at? I'm sort of running out of time. Um, so, you know, we set out with the hopes of seeing sort of redshift moving phonons, which we saw, now seeing sort of particle creation. Now, we weren't able to see that yet because essentially we cannot expand the ring fast enough for sort of the interaction energy to drop quickly enough to generate phonons, but perhaps that's something else we can see. Now, another thing is now, you know, the sort of, you know, um, phonons we see in this situation and sort of the um, sensitivity to the temporal phase is essentially sort of classical stimulated emission of phonons into this phonon field, right? So this is sort of similar to things that have been seen in acoustic black holes. So another thing that would maybe be interesting to see is sort of spontaneous processes or pair productions. Um, but in order to do that, we need to improve our detection threshold. For example, this is something that was similarly recently seen by Jeff Steinhauer's experiments, but here, you know, we average over three runs and they averaged over, you know, 10,000 images. Um, so it would be great to see sort of spontaneous pair production in the future if we can improve our detection limit. Um, and finally, you know, things like looking at horizons would perhaps be interested, uh, interesting to, to look at it in the future. Now, our current work sort of focused on sort of coherent state phonons. But, you know, as I said, you know, if we can sort of extend this into casually dis disconnected regions of space, we could start to see actually how, you know, quantum fluctuations play a role. Um, and also for future experiments, our system's sort of flexible, so we could look at different metric scalings, maybe look at different geometries where you expect different Hubble frictions, um, or, you know, explore other types of analog gravity systems. Now I have just a few seconds um, left. Um, and since this is an animatronics conversation, um, you know, as I said, in the future, we're sort of hoping to look at other types of analog gravity systems, or maybe we could look at event horizons. But, you know, we've also in our system been starting to think about how we can go back to doing more atomtronic types experiments. Now, in the past, as I mentioned, our experiment has looked a lot at how we can create um, atom squids, right? Where we sort of looked at uh, magnetic field sensor squids to see if we could make rotation sensors. And in fact, uh, you know, five years ago or so, our group did in fact make sort of a, a proof of principle rotation sensor using a single potential barrier that we rotated around the ring. And in the system, we could see phase slips. Um, but, and was it a rotation Just sensor? You have five minutes. Awesome. Five Perfect. minutes. OK. Um, so you know, we were able to see discrete phase slips. We saw hysteresis. We should, could measure the current phase relationship. And one could argue that this was a very rudimentary rotation sensor, but it was definitely not a good rotation sensor. Um, for example, we had a sensitivity of about, you know, 100 millihertz and a duty cycle of 30 seconds. So, you know, if you sort of calculate a, a rotation, sensitivity, rotation sensitivity of that, it would be sort of five hertz per square root hertz or something like that. So nothing great. However, what we've seen, you know, with these sort of expanding condensate experiments is, of course, you know, creating collective excitations like phonons are pretty robust. And in fact, you can actually use the precession of those phonon modes as a rotation measurement. And this is something we've also looked at in the past, where here I show the evolution of a standing wave phonon mode again, where now we have background flow in the system. And by fitting the slope of that background flow, this gives you a message a method of precession, right? So this is a, a rotation sensor. <clears throat> so, and using this, you know, we did sort of single shot, you know, measurements of rotation, but the question is, can we actually now take advantage of coherent excitations to make a better type of rotation sensor with a cold gas? So now why would we do that? Well, one reason is that the hope is that we could have a much higher duty cycle. We can make in situ measurements. And, you know, by creating a collective excitation, we're hopefully less sensitive to density perturbations and types in potential perturbations in our ring. So this is something we've been thinking about and actually something we thought about in rebuilding this new experiment. Um, so one way, of course, how do you improve an uh, interferometer? One is that you have, a, of course, much larger rings. You know, we've had sort of 15 micron rings. Um, and of course, having larger cues, so our rotation can process around longer. And, you know, these, um, Thoughts were very much inspired by this paper by Dan Stamper Kern's group, where they did a proof of principle rotation sensor. And for their small ring, which had a, a, rota a size of about you know, 12 microns or so, they predicted they could have a rotation sensitivity of about you know, a radian per second per square root of hertz. Now, how could we do much better than that? Well, of course, a rotation sensor, it scales with your area. So one is by making much larger rings. So in this new apparatus, we have a much better imaging system, which is sort of diffract has an NA of 0.29 and should be diffraction limited. 
or at least near the diffraction limit for rings up to 140 microns. So in this new system, we've recently demonstrated much larger and smoother rings than we've been able to produce in the past. So here we sort of have small rings to rings approaching sort of, you know, at least a, a radius of 50 microns. And we're hoping to be able to push even farther. And the other thing is we've been trying to improve the Q, right? Now, in our system, we have the sort of damping of our, Q, our phonon modes. And we don't quite exactly understand what actually leads to the Q of our modes. Um, if it was just Landau damping, we would expect it to really just depend on temperature, but it definitely seems to depend on more than that. Now, in our previous experiments, we had a Q, a quality factor of about 10 for phonon modes up to three. And in our new experiment, we've seen Qs of up to 14 and um, even, you know, and even, you know, fairly high Qs for very high phonon modes. And of course, the higher phonon mode we use for this um, interferometer, the, the better uh, sensitivity we would have. Now, one challenge we're having is while we have smoother potentials um, when we create static rings, when we try to actually modulate to create phonon modes, we're still sort of struggling with imperfections, but that's something we're working on. And finally, a challenge to sort of doing this interferometer is, as I said, you know, we've seen much larger cues, cues greater than 14, but our, we find that our quality factor varies dramatically from day to day. Um, so we're currently sort of exploring what limits that and also starting to think about, you know, while these phonon excitations are more robust to imperfections in the potential, maybe we could come up with other types of collective excitations. Um, think about doing say magnon interferometry or perhaps solitons, right? Could we sort of launch solitons? Um, so these are sort of sort of the things we're starting to think about um, on sort of the more atomtronics front is how we can make better sort of ex interferometer user collective excitations. And with that, I know I'm out of time. Um, so let me just acknowledge the people in the lab who are doing the work. Um, the early experiments were led by Avinash, who is the senior grad student. Our most recent experiments have been led by Swarnov and Monica. And we continue to have close collaborations with both Steve Eckel, who's moved on to NIST, and Ted Jacobson, um, who is continuing to teach me about cosmology. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Nice, very nice talk. So there are a few questions. Uh, one by uh, Hort Minbayer. I don't know. Perhaps I, I, it looks like the question was marked as answer, but I saw the question, which was, you know, we imprint these very large, you know, yeah. amplitude yeah. phonons, which means we're not going to get linear behavior. And the answer is yes, um, we do. Um, and, you know, with improved detection and analysis, if for sure, if we could introduce phonon modes with a smaller amplitude, that would be beneficial. Yeah, See, and here's another question. What would happen if there are more than one phonon mode, say 11 plus 17? I'm not exactly sure um, what that question was, but essentially, you know, we, we actually may imprint, um, we may not actually completely imprint a clean standing wave mode. Um, and actually, that's something we definitely see when we excite higher M standing wave modes, and perhaps does actually lead to sort of some of the decay of the modes, um, since we're sort of exciting many standing wave modes. Um, and then, let's see here, what is the ma maximum, here's another question, what is the maximum rotational speed to cause the flow in the ring? Um, so the maximum rotation speed is the speed of sound. Um, we can't sort of rotate any faster than that or you start to create excitation. So maybe I have a question. So I didn't uh, get, uh, say, the information on the expansion on the, of the speed of the expansion or the velocity. So, oh, yes. what, so how does this affect the kind of excitations you have? And the second part, it's how the dimension, the tight, the tight uh, so the, the, the radial uh, dimension, uh, yeah, no, the confinement, a, the radial confinement yeah. affects all the job. Yep. And indeed, I think I, I did not mention that. Um, so in the early experiments, we actually uh, varied the um, the rate of expansion. Um, so yeah, so like here you can see we sort of varied the acceleration, um, you know, from say, you know, half C to uh, 1.3 C. Um, so originally we did sort of vary the rate of expansion and our most recent in the expanding and contraction data sets, uh, the maximum change in the radius was about 1.3 times the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you know, in order to the, you're most sensitive to the Hubble friction um, for, you know, frequencies that are on the order of that expansion rate, which is why essentially, you know, we're most sensitive to it when our expansion rate is near the speed of sound. But of course, this puts us in sort of a very non-adiabatic regime. Um, so, you know, as we sort of decrease 
the expansion rate, then we don't see as big of a, a Hubble friction effect. And then the, your question about the radial confinement. Yes. Um, so yeah, so actually in our old ring, we had a much looser radial confinement and we had a much thicker ring, which is actually one of the reasons we actually saw these radial excitations that we created, right? These sort of soliton type creations. Now in our, our recent experiment, um, we have a much better imaging resolution. So we're now able to create, let's see, Oh, I actually don't have it. We're able to create much more narrow rings. Um, and because of that, we're actually no longer seeing these radial excitations because essentially our, you know, we're, we're slowly approximating something a little bit more 1D-ish where we're freezing out those transverse excitations. Thank you. Thank you very much.